this is what we're here for. We're here for topics. We're here for deep discussions about uh, cloud security topics. So I am excited to kick off with uh, Rami McCarthy beyond the AWS security roadmap. Uh, as always, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, especially with Secure. So having with Secure as a partner helps you understand and address the cyber risks associated with business transformation, embedding outcome-based cybersecurity measures tailored to identifying unknown unknowns and to designing mitigation. So thank you with Secure for sponsoring. Uh, as we're new, we always make time for Q and A at these talks. So silence your cell phones. Uh, but afterwards, please stand up. I will bring you the mic so that the people on uh, YouTube can hear us uh, uh, later. Uh, but we'd love to hear uh, what you have to ask from. So with that, uh, please welcome our speakers. Thanks. Waiting for this to pick me up. Awesome. Uh, glad to be kicking things off. And uh, thanks to the organizers for having me. And thanks everyone who's in this room. Quick show of hands. How many people have read Scott's AWS Security Maturity Roadmap? Great, no peer pressure, but the rest of you are about to be a little confused because I'm not going to mention anything further about it. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Rami, I work on cloud and infrastructure security at Figma, which is a design company. Uh, we are hiring, that link takes you to our cute little security job sites. If you're interested, I've found my last two jobs through Ford CloudSec, highly recommend it. Um, I also contribute to TLDRSec, so if you wanna read more things I've done, you can find it there. Uh, this talk is based on the fact that when I joined Figma, uh, the pitch for the job was, we've shipped Scott's roadmap, help us figure out what's next. And that caused just a tiny bit of panic for me. Uh, this talk's gonna aggregate sort of all my learnings since then about the options for your program beyond Scott's roadmap, what the projects are teams tackle and how they tackle them with a bit of a discussion of, you know, whether you should build, buy or adopt. And I'm gonna be opinionated here um, and I'm gonna mention a lot of vendors. I'm not endorsing any of them, nor am I saying they're horrible. Please don't hold it against me. Uh, this is gonna be very fast paced. The slides are live. I'll put the link up again at the end. Uh, there are a lot of links to click, so feel free to follow up on that. And quick aside, not all cloud security programs are the same. I'm talking about a sort of specific shape of cloud security program that's engineering and automation uh, oriented that focuses on generally zero trust architectures, maybe a software product. Um, and I'm a maximalist on cloud security. Uh, Aaron mentioned like the history of cloud as infrastructure and some things uh, end up sucked into our cloud security programs uh, through either force of will or force of gravity. Um, and then we follow principles like guardrails, not gatekeepers, and paved roads to really make it easy for engineers to work in the cloud safely. Uh, and mentioning that brings in this like scary specter of Netflix. And I wanna call it out out front. Uh, Netflix has been an incredible contributor to cloud security space. I'm gonna point to a lot of their blog posts and tools, but I really wanna challenge the assumption that what Netflix blogs about is going to be the right decision for your security program. Uh, Netflix's solutions are built for their opportunities and constraints, not yours. They predate open source offerings, they predate managed services, they have a great engineering team, they've scaled beyond the utility of many things they can pull off the shelf, and they have specific data gravity and account architecture. Um, it's not just Netflix, I'm gonna mention a lot of solutions, blog posts, ideas, and I understand they may not apply to you, it's okay, take what's useful, leave the rest. Um, hopefully you learn something you can take back to your company and help us all sort of build sustainable cloud security programs. I mentioned build versus buy versus adopt. I think it's a really important framework, especially in cloud security. Aaron alluded to all the vendors uh, in the space. Many of them are great, um, but you could spend all day proof of concepting, buying, procuring, deploying vendors, or you could spend all day building a solution. You could do a year long project for something that's cheap off the shelf. Um, when I'm thinking about build versus buy versus adopt, I like to use this framework. Uh, it talks about like, are we solving a problem that's differentiated, unique to our company at a scale maybe that's unique to our company? What are the costs and efforts of integrating versus the costs and efforts of building internally and making sure we take operational uh, maintenance costs into account? Um, so I encourage you all to pick a framework when you have these discussions internally about how you should solve your cloud security problems. I like this one, you can pick a different one, uh, but really be nuanced about uh, where it's valuable to build, where it's valuable to buy, and where maybe there's a cheap, easy win um, pulled from the great open source practitioner community. Awesome. 
Uh, we're making great time. We're going to do the speed run through capabilities and controls. My goal here is to give as complete a view of a landscape as possible, which is going to mean skimming over each example. There are lots of links to go back on, and I'm always happy to talk in the hallway after, uh, and hopefully this can spur some discussions. So first thing we talk about is secrets management. I find when I walk into a room of cloud security practitioners, when I'm interviewing for jobs, when I start a new role, so secrets management is something every team has to solve, and they have to solve it pretty early, because as soon as you want production workloads, you want your secrets managed safely, mismanaged secrets cause breaches. You need a common set of features. You need to allow developers to create secrets. You need to be able to rotate those, grant access to them, destroy them, audit them, inject them into local development environments. If you look on the adopt side here, <laughs> I give four examples of companies that have built tools that basically use DynamoDB, KMS, Secrets Manager to orchestrate this in AWS. Those tools are great. You can also buy options. HashCorp Vault is a really you know, sort of thick solution to this problem. There are startups tackling it. Uh, and here's where I get opinionated. I actually think this is a case where you should build. You have to really understand the intricacies of your secrets management platform. It becomes really tightly integrated to everything else you do. And if you adopt one of these solutions off the shelf, you're going to find yourself trapped at some point based on their limitations, capabilities, and the ways it doesn't fit your environment. Um, they're also often too configurable for what you need in your organization. Uh, if you are going to adopt one and one's a perfect fit, these are great tools, like nothing against them. Um, but I found folks get uh, overwhelmed with the complexity there. Uh, and be wary of prematurely going for like a full secrets management platform. You can get pretty far on sort of native features with some light automation around it. Asset inventory is the first of a few sort of compounding controls we talk about. Um, most of you have probably done something here already, but if you haven't, there are some open source tools these days, Steampipe, Cloud Query, these also have commercial versions. Asset inventory is just answering the question of what do I have, which is a prerequisite to answering how you secure it. And here I say these off-the-shelf solutions will get you really far. If you are the first cloud security engineer or maybe even the first security engineer, buying and deploying a full CSPM is premature, and you're going to spend all your time wrangling that single tool, that single problem. Instead, pull something off the shelf, start to layer in controls on top of your inventory, and be really pragmatic about how you dispatch those. And please, please, please don't write anything that creates an asset inventory based on cloud APIs. It has been done so many times. I see it created a lot. It's an interesting problem, but one that's undifferentiated. When you're going beyond asset inventory, we're in the CSPM space. Yes, this is a Gartner term. Actually, their market guide for cloud native application protection platforms, CNAP, is pretty good. Um, but basically, you do want to continuously assess the security posture uh, of your cloud. And there are open source options, some of whom are sponsors. There are um, also options to buy here. I listed a few of the ones that I think have a lot of mind share. Uh, and you know, I think no spoilers, but you probably should just buy a CSPM when you're ready. Uh, building these, I think, five years ago was really common, and a lot of organizations have open sourced their examples of building a CSPM in-house. Um, so long as you can tightly scope your contract with a CSPM vendor to give you just the things you need and not their horizontal platform, these tools work pretty well, give you what you need. Uh, but don't let them decide your security program. Just because a CSPM has 150 findings doesn't mean they're all valid in your environment against your risks. Uh, be pragmatic about how you work with other teams. Uh, and if you do want to build, that's cool. Do it on top of an open source inventory tool, not the cloud APIs. Um, also worth calling out, there are native services here. I'm not a huge fan of them, but I know they work for other people. Automated remediation is sort of the natural continuation of CSPMs. This is built into pretty much any tool you'd buy. Uh, I'm not a huge fan as a spoiler. I know companies like Twilio have frameworks that they've sort of scaled and made it easy to work with. Um, personal take, I just would not do this if you can get away with it. Uh, you get much higher leverage over infrastructure as code. You get much higher leverage over choke points for changes, if at all possible. That being said, I know my environment is not yours. If you're in an environment with a lot of legacy infrastructure or you know, you've come in uh, to an environment that predates Terraform, cloud formation, uh, maybe auto remediation has uh, some juice worth the squeeze. Um, it's 
hard to apply it with sufficient context. So if you are going to roll this out, think about the ways it can involve developers, right? Can you give them a warning before <laughs> nuking their services? Can you, um, you know, seek additional context input? Empower developers to own security. Auto remediation creates this model where the security team is uh, sort of paternalistic towards other teams um, if deployed poorly, uh, and I'm really not a fan. So what I do like is secure infrastructure as code modules, whether you're in Terraform or CloudFormation or Pulumi. Um, if you have worked in cloud security program using infrastructure as code, you have probably written the secure private bucket module for S3 and told all your developers to use it. I have written it three times. I would like to never write it again. <laughs> there are uh, options to pull off the shelf. Asecure.cloud has a bunch of examples that are pretty viable. Uh, Terraform registry also itself, you can look at the code, make sure it fits your needs. Um, look, you should probably build it. It's fine to pull something off the shelf. I don't think the purchasable solutions are super broad yet. Uh, and I haven't yet seen one that um, I have paid for. But uh, the trick with secure IAC modules is pair them with SAST, because you really want to be able to detect when folks are using the raw resources and not your modules. And the second thing is, don't just do a module for a single resource. Pair together security infrastructure as a consumable module to make your developer's life easy, make security decisions easy, pave roads. A common example is if you can put together a way to allow developers to secure internal applications behind like an ALB and your SSO IDP, right? That's a great thing to package up and expose as a module to make it really easy for them to do the right thing. Um, but don't just go and spend six months building modules hoping people will use them, like wait for a need to manifest uh, and be thoughtful about the amount of investment here. And that SaaS thing I mentioned, right? There are dedicated tools, and you can also use flexible platforms like SEMGREP. Um, a lot of CSPMs these days are also reaching into code as well. Uh, and uh, this blog post from Christoph is actually really good. It compares a bunch of different IC scanning tools as of about a year ago. And it's hard to go wrong here. Um, generally, your infrastructure as code is going to be less complicated than like your actual application logic that you're running SAST against. So most of these tools can do an OK job. Be very careful with what rules you roll out. If you tell every developer to encrypt everything all the time, you're going to slow down the business. Uh, and that's not what we're here for. Um, and if at all possible, surface this sort of detection at PR time to the person who owns the code. Empower your developers to make thoughtful decisions about security. And if you need to guardrail them, do it in parallel with the security team's awareness so that they can check in and help people uh, you know, learn how to do things uh, the, you know, the happy path. Next up, this Scott actually does mention, I don't want to claim he didn't, um, but detection engine, uh, deception engineering, honeypots, honey tokens. Uh, Thinkst Canary um, has been around a while and is a pretty cool tool. And they offer a free canarytokens.org service that'll help you get set up with canary tokens for your cloud environment. You can also just deploy an AWS API key that's defanged and tie a detection into your SIM. Um, these are pretty easy to do. Uh, you probably want to deploy them in high value targets, whether that's S3 buckets or CI CD systems or drop them on EC2 instances. What I'd caution against is deploying canary tokens everywhere and just waiting to panic when it happens. Like, spend the day to think about, okay, someone has accessed my canary token. What do we do about it? Um, I also would say, like, Will uh, has a great blog post on a really sort of sophisticated architecture for programmatically deploying and managing canary tokens. You probably don't need that until you've done a lot about core controls in your cloud. This is going to be three quick slides on the theme of access. So we have granular access. How do I make least privilege IAM roles for the right users? Um, how do I ensure there's no privilege escalation? Open source tools vendors both exist and parlays into access management. Um, how do I ensure that the right users get access to those roles? How do I make this discoverable? How do I improve the ergonomics of accessing my complicated, mature cloud environment? Um, again, this is something like Netflix has launched console.me. Uh, Common Fate has granted here as well. And this then moves into temporary access. I don't just want developers to be able to access a role. I want them to only need it um, when they need it. Uh, and I want that to be for a very short period of time. I want approvals. I want to be able to audit that for compliance. 
Um, there are vendors here. I haven't seen a lot of off-the-shelf solutions. And really, I think this is a big problem that I'm underselling in cloud, right? Like I am is saying we spend a lot of time talking about these conferences for a reason. I would say just-in-time access is about the point at which you probably should consider buying something currently. It's not solved for well in the open source ecosystem. And it's kind of scary to build and undifferentiated. Um, I think you can get pretty far otherwise on open source, on automation in-house, um, on building. And make sure you're partnering with other internal stakeholders. Avoid the security team being the only people who can change IAM. I've been there. I think many of us have been there. Uh, it is an easy pattern to fall into, and it uh, can really increase a lot of toil and make it hard to move fast. Beyond just single account, you have multi-account, right? So uh, the account boundary is a really helpful security boundary. Um, and that's blast radius, that's for IAM sort of inherently. Uh, you can use things like org formation depending on the patterns you're using. A lot of people just tie together like AWS Nuke with some other automation. I haven't seen anyone trying to sell me anything. AWS has Control Tower, which works for some people some of the time. And so unfortunately, this is one I think you have to build and I hope we won't have to in a few years. Um, you know incrementally improve your automation. Be thoughtful if you're going from two accounts to four, you probably don't need to build like a magical account vending machine. If you know you're gonna want 100 new accounts in the next six months, maybe it's time to invest up front. Uh, make it easy for internal partners to get safe boundaries for their code, right? If you fail to do this, at some point you'll find there's a lot of gravity towards folks compiling everything into a single account. Uh, and that can really increase your risk, and it's very expensive to migrate cross account. On the offensive side, right, there's control validation, attack simulation, open source tools like Stras, Red Team. Uh, the vendor category is often like automated pen testing, which as someone who used to do security consulting, just gives me the ick. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of this category of product, no offense. Um, but I do think there's value in making sure your controls are functioning as intended. And I think that one thing that we don't do enough is leverage tools other teams are using. If you have internal partners with a QA platform, you can really just bake your security validation into there. Um, and frankly, when you deploy a control, validating it at that time is probably enough for most security programs for a pretty long time. This sort of automated continuous validation is great, but it's something I'd only consider late in your program's maturity journey. Uh, and also just make sure you're spending the right amount of time breaking versus building. These tools, these findings are only useful if they help you make the company more secure. And that comes in when you actually fix the things you're finding, make them more resilient. Egress monitoring and filtering is something I don't think we talk about enough, and so I really wanted to call it out. Stripe launched Smokescreen years ago at this point, which is sort of an open source solution. Lyft has a blog post. I'm seeing a little more of companies talking publicly. This is a really powerful control post compromise. And frankly, in cloud environments, I think there are so many ways that an attacker could get in that thinking deeply about post compromise becomes important. I haven't seen a lot of vendor answers in this space yet. Um, I would say it's pretty risky to roll this out, especially if you put your egress filtering uh, as a single point of failure. Um, suddenly, your security team need to be as good as your SREs, which we hope they are, but they are in always. Uh, and um, if you're not thoughtful about how you'll expand the allowed connections, this is really a hamster wheel of pain. So coming up towards the end here, infrastructure access is another topic I won't do justice to. Um, this is something I'm going to be spending my entire year on at work pretty much. Uh, but you probably start as a small startup with no security team on SSH. Hopefully you can move people to something like SSM. Hopefully you take SSH off the internet. And then what? Well, the answer right now is there are a lot of platforms you can buy that solve for Kubernetes and your databases and you know, getting IAM access, um, getting onto servers, whether they be ECS or EKS or whatever. Uh, you also can do some things where you do network-based access with something like TailScale and then uh, auth separately. I think here it's really hard. I kind of want to say buy, like, right? This is a really undifferentiated problem that has a lot of edge cases and complexity. But 
often buying is too big an answer to a small problem you have. Like maybe you just need to solve this for servers at first. But start talking about what good looks like early. You won't get anywhere stopping your coworkers from doing their jobs. Um, and like egress, there's day perimeters. There's a whole talk later, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skim over this. I would say 1 PM, I think, uh, one of these two rooms. You can hear more about data perimeters, where right now we're all building, and I think we're all sort of early to this game. Finally, I want to call out there were things I'd love to talk more about. Vulnerability management as an element of cloud security programs, detection engineering and security data lakes, continuous compliance, DFIR preparedness, runtime security, service-to-service -service authentication. The real takeaway is that beyond Scott's roadmap, which I do think is relatively universally applicable, prioritization is inherently custom to your risk and business. You can't do this all. Pick some risks, run them to the ground. Um, but don't uh, you know, close the back door and leave the front door open. Uh, and remember that anything you build, you'll have to support. Slides are live uh, at that link if you want to click any of these links or go back. Thank you all. Thanks for kicking things off, Rami. Any questions? Uh, I'll start with one. Um, you highlighted a couple cases where teams should collaborate with others. I am in particular uh, and your QA team. How do you decide what the cloud security team should do versus what, what other teams should be supporting you in? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm a little biased because I'm a cloud security engineer and I would like to do as little as possible. I feel like I'm fundamentally concerned about how the company can be secure and then how I can do that with as little work on our overstretched security teams as possible. So what I do is I look for opportunities where teams have needs uh, that they need met. And we talk about the ways that security expertise comes into play and the ways that the business best can staff those. So really, if there is a problem we are solving for another team, I highly encourage you to talk about what that team can contribute to the solution. And more importantly, where are the right places to own this long term. In a small company, security ends up owning everything that they build, so you'll end up doing some like all of traffic is owned by security. And you want to avoid that by talking about like what security can do to help, but who's actually accountable for owning those systems long term. Um, a quick question. So you have a lot of tools and open source products that you mentioned in here, um, a dozen or so you could apply. What type of, do, do you have any recommendations on a, like a unified dashboard? So as a developer, I don't have to go look at 20 different tools to find out what my security posture is? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sort of biased out of this. So I advise an ASPM startup. I think that's kind of the product category. Security Hub sort of does this at AWS. But basically, at some point, you will want a single pane of glass. Probably, you can build this into your ticketing system. Um, yeah, I'd say ASPM is the product category if you need an answer there. And I think that uh, it is really valuable to scale your program, make sure you're homogenizing, deduplicating, providing context, dispatching, tracking, and maintaining compliance on your findings. A uh, question from Slack. So beyond the AWS sample, did you happen to see any general break glass systems worth consideration uh, um, outside of AWS? Yeah, there is one that uh, I recently saw a talk about for GCP um, that is from their Cloud Labs. I don't remember the name offhand, but I think if you search just in time access GCP on GitHub, you'll pull it up. Otherwise, I think on the open source side, not much. And my guess is that this is because these are really integration heavy. Uh, so like maybe you'll find something that's specific to your IDP cloud platform and, and systems you're trying to access. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I haven't seen a ton out there. And I also don't see everything. So, you know, if I missed it, apologies. Send it to me. I just did. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> just wanted to add a little bit of perspective. I love the idea you put up there of um, automating, like automated security remediations can be dangerous and can be risky. Um, However, and I agree with perspective, start with as many preventive controls as you can on educating developers and providing them good templates. Um, my current company is one where we have sort of distributed access to AWS to teams that are not security people. They're not even developers in many cases. We've got like sales guys doing tinkering with AWS and brand management. And so just wanted to add the perspective that I have started to rely really heavily on automated remediation 
for those people who aren't developers enough to touch IAC, and they're around monkeying in the console. And so I limit their roles as much as possible, but I also rely on preventive controls to go like slap their hands when they do something wrong. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you, and I, I hope I called it out in the slide that like if you can get away with it not using automated remediation. That being said, you require executive buy-in because the first time you close an important security group on someone, they'll be knocking at your door. Um, and also, if at all possible, like idealist, you would surface a pane of glass with these problems to the team that owns them, and you have company-wide consensus that if teams are going to manage their own infrastructure, they own the risk. Uh, hey, um, very nice talk. Good to see everything in one place. Uh, I was wondering if you have uh, any suggestions around quantifying the maturity, right? So something like, okay, this is a CSIF, or maybe this is how cloud security maturity progresses from year one to year two to year three and beyond. Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like you need to pick a maturity model and stick with it. In past companies recently, I've been using OWASP CDM um, and modeling cloud security over that. And that gives executives a sort of qualitative heat map where they can tell trends, um, but also lets you be pretty nuanced about the sort of controls and projects you fit into it. From a quantitative side, generally I look at control coverage, control adoption, right? It's uh, how many controls are we rolling them out? Where are we rolling them out? How effective are they? Um, and then you have to tie that into like the costs of security um, when done poorly, which is how are incidents, how are misconfigurations, are these trending down, how fast are developers moving, how much service are we providing? So no, no solid pithy answer there, but that's some of the ways I think about it. Uh, thank you. Great questions. I know there are more out there, uh, and one from Kat in Slack that I'm sure we'll follow up on. Um, the uh, um, uh, and uh, the question about metrics is interesting because it'll be a great lead, I think, into our next talk. Uh, success criteria for your CSPM uh, by David White. We'll be starting that in about three minutes, and I'm sure Rami will stick around for questions uh, after this round. Thanks, everyone. See you in three minutes.